So our speaker, our last speaker for the day is Dr. Bert Lapantri. He is board certified in infectious diseases and clinical microbiology, and he is currently the chief of the infectious disease and clinical epidemiology, and also associate medical director of the Intermountain Infectious Disease Clinical Program. He is also the medical director of the Intermountain Central Microbiology Lab, and we do thank him for being willing to give us an update on COVID-19 testing. So. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for sticking around for the, the last show. Um, so I um, appreciate the opportunity to present at this uh, uh, co conference. And I started with this slide because uh, there's only two things that I liked about COVID when it came to work. Um, one is all the people that I met uh, throughout the pandemic and worked with closely. And the second one was the memes. And this is one of my favorite memes. And I thought I'd start here because this captured where we were at the very beginning. Uh, I remember answering these phone calls uh, you know, talk, and talking to the public health department. Yeah, this person just got off the plane from Italy. He's got the classic symptoms. He, he's not hospitalized, but we want him tested. It's like, well, if he's not hospitalized, he may have COVID, but we're not gonna test him. So it was a really, really challenging time uh, back then. And things have gotten a lot better, but in a way it's still as confusing. It seems as sometimes as confusing as it was in the beginning. Um, these are my disclosures, the learning objectives, and I thought I'd start with where we are today. I'm sure you may have seen this uh, yesterday uh, in Dr. Webb's presentation, uh, but um, as of October 3rd, there are about 235 million cases of COVID globally uh, with almost 5 million deaths. But the most important and most fascinating number is the amount of doses of vaccines administered, so that, which are 6.3 billion. So within a year, there were 6.3 billion doses of uh, vaccine administered globally. And that, that is just stunning when you pause to think about it. Like, how do you administer that many vaccines in, in, in such a large scale? So we're, uh, globally, we're still in a, a pretty rough shape. In the US, this is the epi curve as of October 2nd. And it looks like we are uh, enjoying or experiencing a, a downward trend in COVID cases uh, in, in, in the US. And this is a similar um, a curve that's seen in many countries throughout the world. Um, and this is the epidemiology in Utah. And this uh, inf uh, slide, the date on this slide comes from the uh, case count at the Department of Health website. And um, on the, the banner, uh, what you see, if you total the numbers, there are, there were 510,000 cases of COVID in Utah, um, and there were 1.9 million uh, vaccine doses administered. So if you aggregate it all, it's about 60 to 65% of our population in Utah is immune uh, uh, by one way or the other. And uh, this is the epi curve um, uh, of what we're experiencing right now. And what I pointed out is that a year ago, that arrow points to where we were a year ago um, compared to where we are now. And it looks like in Utah, we're experiencing a downward uh, trajectory in the case counts. Uh, but um, a year ago, we, uh, so we're a little bit worse off than where we were a year ago, but it looks like we're heading in uh, the right direction. And this is the uh, COVID ICU hospitalizations and total ICU hospitalization in Utah, and the arrow points to where we were a year ago, and you could see that we're a little bit worse off uh, in total ICU utilization and COVID ICU utilization compared to a year ago. And this is uh, a summary of the uh, daily hospital census, uh, ICU and non-ICU uh, for Utah, and it looks like we're a bit worse off now uh, than we were uh, starting the respiratory season one year ago. And the final uh, data slide I wanted to share from the uh, public health website is the seven day hospitalization rate by age group. And again, you could see that um, right compared to a year ago, we're about exactly the same. Um, so we're kind of at this little period now where the next several weeks is gonna help uh, identify what trajectory we're gonna take into this respiratory season. And a lot of this is driven by 
the uh, molecular changes in the virus. So you've heard a lot about all the variants of interest, variants of concern, and I just want to take a few moments to just go through the terminology of this, uh, and the ways that these uh, different molecular variants are characterized. So the variants of interest are uh, strains that have specific genetic markers that are predicted to impact transmission rates, uh, diagnostic performance, uh, therapeutics, or even immune escape. And uh, there's evidence that, this, uh, that these variants that cause increased numbers or clusters in certain populations, but it's very limited in scope. And these are the ones that in the table that you've heard of. So there are three major uh, classifications for the variants that are used. One is the WHO classification, which has given us a great education on the Greek alphabet. Uh, the other one is the Pango lineage. And the third way of classifying them are the next strain clades, which is not something that's talked about more commonly. The Pango lineage and the WHO uh, designation are the most common uh, ways that these variants are described. And how it works is you sequence the virus, you upload the strains to each respective database, and they'll uh, pop out a uh, lineage de designation. And it's updated all the time with new variants upon the variants. So there are multiple delta variants now. And the ones that we heard a lot about are the lambda and the mu. And um, the lambda was uh, caused increased rates in Peru, and mu was the one that was found uh, causing increased outbreaks in um, Colombia. And there was great concern that these two would take hold and spread in the U.S. And uh, they have been shown in vitro to escape uh, the antibody response uh, much more effectively. Um, but it turns out that these two, while they did show up uh, and they did increase, they've pretty much been gone. So uh, mu has not been detected since the end of September. Uh, so the, these two were not effective at outcompeting the Delta variant. The variants of concern are the ones that aren't predicted to. They have been shown uh, uh, to have uh, impacts on the diagnostics, the treatments, and the vaccines. There's evidence of increased transmissibility, and uh, there's evidence that there's some increased uh, disease severity. And the, the ones of concern are um, listed in the table there. And of course, we're dealing with the Delta variant. The globe is dealing with the Delta variant. That is the uh, formal one that has outcompeted um, all other variants. Um, prior to the, uh, the Delta, uh, we were dealing, dealing with the Alpha variant or, uh, that ar arose from the UK. And the Beta variants, the South African variant, the Gamma variant came out of uh, Brazil. Those two variants were, we were very worried about, uh, but they have been outcompeted by the Delta variant. And uh, fortunately, we have not had variants of high consequence. These things have failures to diagnostic tests, failures to, uh, 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 to the vaccine, and uh, they have reduced susceptibility to the EUA-approved therapeutics. And so this slide here is taken from nextstrain.org, and it shows the, uh, the evolution of uh, uh, the uh, COVID pandemic throughout time. And uh, this one I just picked for uh, what's going on in the U.S. And this is exactly what's going on in the globe. So it's an identical uh, uh, snapshot. The, uh, the graph on top with all the little peaks are the mutations that have accumulated uh, throughout uh, this pandemic in the different genetic regions. The region of the greatest concern are the spike is the blue uh, region. And that's the spike protein, um, and that's what the antibodies uh, or the uh, vaccines um, were de developed against. And you can see that the virus has mutated many, many times in the spike region throughout this pandemic. The lower half of this slide shows the strain, the clade variation throughout time. And uh, what's interesting about COVID is that the original strain that left China was replaced quickly. So by the end of February, early March, it pretty much was not, no longer existent. And what we had faced since uh, March has been a, a variant that originated in, the, in Europe. I believe it was Italy, I believe. And uh, it had uh, developed a mutation, uh, D614G, that made it much more uh, competitive. And we had been dealing with that particular variant uh, right up until uh, December. And, uh, Throughout that period, there were sublineages within that parent variant. Since December, um, 
you could see here that we experienced the alpha wave. And uh, th that one, again, was, uh, originated in the UK. And it kind of was percolating in the background and just took off and outcompeted the, uh, the uh, originals, the, the second variant. And then there are a bunch of different little variants that have developed throughout time in the multicolored section of this graph. And then, of course, we had appearance of the, of the Delta variant. And that thing outcompeted everything. And it's dominated uh, the, the, the global pandemic since that time. And this is uh, what happened in Utah. This is an incomplete uh, sequencing um, map. Uh, so early in the pandemic, uh, the uh, sequencing coverage approximated about 1% of all the tests or all the cases that had occurred. The, the coverage has increased through time, but uh, we, weren't, we were not unique uh, in that the alpha variant came and quickly was replaced by the Delta variant. And 90 plus percent of what we see are the Delta variant. So whenever I get a call for about a patient interested in knowing what their variant is that caused their infection, I tell them 90% chance it's gonna be Delta. And one of the, uh, two, there are two things that uh, lead the Delta variant to be much more um, successful as the dominant variant. One is the shorter time to disease onset. So previously, the average time to disease onset from exposure was about five days. Uh, with the Delta variant, the average time is somewhere between three to four days. So uh, patients become symptomatic, infectious, much quicker than the previous uh, strains. The other thing that is emerging, I haven't seen uh, publications on this, just preprints, but uh, the, the, variant, the Delta variant has a much higher viral load. And so the Alpha variant was much more infectious than the, uh, the European variant that dominated earlier. And this, uh, the Delta variant is two times more infectious than the Alpha variant. So there are thoughts that this could be just as infectious as the uh, varicella virus. But the good news is uh, that the vaccine does, the vaccines remain efficacious against the Delta variant. Um, we just have to get it in the arms and we just have to have time pass so that the immunity develops. And this table is a summary of the different um, publications out there or different data sets out there talking about the efficacy of the Delta variant. And you could find this at the uh, CDC website listed uh, below. Okay, so um, the big question uh, that we face right now is, will we face a twindemic this respiratory viral season? And uh, twindemic uh, alludes to the co-circulation of COVID and influenza. And the big fear about this is, I showed you that our hospitals are full and our ICUs are full, but if we do experience an influenza outbreak, that's just gonna pile on top of what we're already dealing with and it will um, strap an already strapped uh, medical system uh, even greater. And um, so that, that's one of the uh, major concerns. And um, historically, what happens in the Southern Hemisphere predicts what happens in the US. And this is a, a table summarizing the influenza pandemic or epidemics throughout time in the America region. And it comes from the WHO and the Pan American uh, uh, Organization. And the top uh, curve is North America. And um, what is interesting, you can see clear seasonal pattern to the epidemics. And in uh, 2020, there was just an abrupt cutoff in uh, influenza. And that may be a reflection of the shifting in the testing patterns. A lot of our uh, labs stopped testing for influenza in the, in the community. So um, we, it vanished quickly, and it never showed up uh, for last year's um, influenza season when there was that question of, will we face a twindemic? And on the bottom is the southern cone. So that's the southern hemisphere. And you can see that uh, their pattern occurs in our, their epidemics occur in our summer. And what they noticed was, again, a, just an abrupt cessation of uh, influenza in last year's um, flu season, and it didn't show up this year. So that, that's pretty encouraging. And this is what happened in Australia. And so you can see each um, colored uh, line represents the influenza season each year. And in the very bottom, the blue, the flat gray line represents what happened in 2020. There's virtually no influenza. And in this year's flu season in Australia, they didn't notice any influenza either. So if past is precedent, uh, 
and what happens in the southern hemisphere truly predicts what happens up here, um, I think we may be in good shape. But they also wore masks, and I don't believe they fought about masks as much as we did up here. Um, but the thing that was really wild this season was what happened with RSV. And uh, the thing that makes me pause and say that, you know, don't just rest on what's happening down there because influenza is unpredictable enough, and it's even more unpredictable now. But with RSV, we experienced an unseasonal uh, epidemic this summer. And you can see that in the top graph. That's um, North America. In uh, 2019, or is that? It's 2020, there was an abrupt disappearance in the winter. And then we started noticing a rise in um, RSV during the summer months. And that was sustained and it's still ongoing. And that was a similar pattern that was seen in the Andean region, second from the bottom, uh, and also in Brazil and uh, the Southern Cone. So RSV did, uh, came back um, fairly aggressively and in a, in a really unusual time of year. So when faced with a lot of uncertainty, I did what I normally do during uh, COVID. I consulted with my magic eight ball. And uh, this is what it says. Uh, will we have a twindemic this flu season? And I got a maybe. I don't know what to do with that. So what we're doing at Intermountain, this is going to be a challenging flu year because there are no manufacturers making any influenza-only tests. So uh, most of the tests that are out there are EUA-approved combination tests. So it'll be COVID um, and um, influenza A and B. And there's one that uh, some that have RSV in it. So what we'll have is a rapid RT-PCR with the, the combination, the fourplex with uh, COVID, RSV, and influenza A and B. And again, we don't really have any options for influenza alone, but we should not be testing for flu without testing for uh, COVID this um, respiratory season and probably the next few. And this is a testing guideline from the CDC for this season. If a patient is going to be admitted to the hospital with um, a, respiratory illness, uh, they should be tested for both COVID and influenza. If the patient is in the ambulatory setting and um, in the, a, a knowledge that the patient is indeed infected with influenza will influence treatment, then it's recommended to test for influenza. Um, but everyone should be tested for COVID. Uh, and uh, so within Intermountain, we're not gonna have that op option for testing for one or the other. Uh, in our ambulatory setting, it's going to be testing. We're going to be testing for both. So one of the other things that uh, continues is, are the challenges. Um, we can, uh, things are a lot better than when it was uh, than a year ago, uh, but we still face swab shortages. Uh, there's still a significant allocation on the rapid PCR tests, uh, so we're uh, we're going to struggle from that standpoint. And the sample collection is a problem. So in the beginning, we set up all these. Uh, testing, uh, drive up testing sites, and uh, we could not maintain staffing of that. Um, and uh, with five to 10,000 uh, COVID specimens coming into the lab every day, it, became, it was a very big challenge in getting it through, registered, uh, cataloged, and brought to the molecular lab. So uh, those challenges continue and will impact turnaround times. In Intermountain, uh, the ways to get COVID tested, um, we've shifted to the medical model uh, and that is uh, basically a doc uh, has to, or a caregiver has to order the test. So uh, you can call your doc and, and ask for one, or you can call Connect Care, and uh, they can route, uh, both will route to a self-collection site. Uh, primary care clinics will start soon start to be testing with antigen tests. Um, and uh, in the, if you're sick enough to be seen, uh, the Instacares will do a rapid uh, site, a test on site. Um, and it's about a 30 minute turnaround time. Uh, and, but you have to get checked in to be seen by a provider uh, to have that test run. Um, and if you're not sick enough to be, have a test run on site, uh, samples can be collected and sent to the, the main lab for uh, uh, the standard PCR testing. Uh, we had to go back to the community testing because uh, when we disbanded the test sites, volumes dropped. And uh, I think that was a disservice because um, the, the variants were circulating and we reduced the ability uh, to test our community members. So we have since switched back, uh, but with a different model. So we use uh, a self-collection site and we have 67 self-collection sites scattered throughout the state. And how you access that is by completing a, 
um, Qualtrics survey, which can be found at that link. Uh, and then after you complete the survey, uh, you can select the nearest self-collection site. And this is an example of what this one of our self-collection sites look like. Um, you go in on the left and you pick up your kit, you go out to the car, you collect your sample. Uh, after you complete the survey, you'll get a, a ten, an 11 digit code uh, that you have to put on your label along with name and uh, date of birth. After you do all that, you come and there's a video you could watch and there are instructions in the kit. Um, you could then bring it back to the drop-off side and put it in that, uh, that wall-mounted box. Here's some other uh, ways to get tested in, in Utah with the other major testing partners. Uh, the um, University of Utah has uh, uh, collection sites and the public health department has uh, collection sites. A lot of them are manned by NOMI Health. Um, and then there's the Test Utah site and their samples are now sent to ARUP lab for testing. And this is uh, the PCR turnaround times for all the major testing labs. Uh, ARUP is uh, the, uh, on the far left. Uh, the Intermountain Lab site's next. LabCorp is next. And then Test Utah and um, the uh, Utah Public Health Lab. Okay, so I'm going to shift base a little bit and get in some little details about um, uh, the COVID tests. Uh, there's a lot of confusion. I hear rapid all the time, saliva, this, that, and the other. Um, there are three main categories for COVID tests. Uh, there's the molecular uh, diagnostic tests, there's the antigen tests, and then there are antibody tests. I'll just say antibody tests don't have a role in diagnosing uh, COVID, so I won't be spending a lot of time talking about them. Um, the molecular tests are the gold standard tests, and they actually detect the viral RNA. These uh, amplify whatever material is present to a high enough amount so that you can identify it. The antigen tests detect the viral proteins. There is no amplification, so whatever is there is what you're looking for, and they are less sensitive than the RT-PCRs. So with the molecular test, there are two broad categories. One is the RT-PCR. This is the gold standard test. It's a little more complex. Uh, it requires instrumentation, and uh, it cycles uh, uh, to high temperatures, and cool. there's a cool uh, heating temp um, cycling for about 40 cycles, and each time uh, it cycles, there's viral amplification. Um, these are generally slower. There is uh, one rapid method, the Expert Express, and that takes about uh, 30 to 50 minutes, depending on which configuration. The COVID only is about 50 minutes. Their fourplex is about 30 minutes. They can't meet their demands, uh, and so uh, that's one of the ones that we use in our community, but it is, um, um, is very tough going for the company to, to meet all the demand out there. The second molecular method is the LAMP method or isothermal method. So this, um, the primers and probes and the chemis chemistry is such that the amplification occurs at a very um, a stable temperature. There's no cycling. So it does not require big instruments and these tend to be faster and um, they have a tiny bit lower sensitivity compared to the RT-PCRs. Um, and you don't get a CT value with, uh, with uh, uh, the isothermal test uh, like you do with most of the RT-PCRs. And uh, just wanted to point out there are two of these uh, LAMP, the isothermal tests that are available, uh, the Abbott ID Now and the Q. The Abbott ID Now takes about 13 to 15 minutes to, to finalize, and the Q is about 20 minutes. The top is the, the instrument um, for the ID now, and the bottom is the, uh, what the Q test looks like, and it's this chargeable reader, uh, which is the biggest instrument, with a cartridge and the test wand, swab wand, that goes into that cartridge, and it gets read by your, um, your iPhone. Um, and it, it, it's, it's, a, it's an interesting test, and uh, full disclosure, I, I bought this. It's, an over the, it's approved for over-the-counter tests, so I have this at my home. It is a bit pricey but it, it's, it's a really interesting test. But how do those perform? There's a lot of papers out there on the ID now. I just use this one to show, this is a comparison of the ID now and the Expert Express from Cepheid compared to the Roche Cobos. The Roche Cobos is probably the most sensitive COVID test on the market. And so they compared these two assays to that test. And uh, what's shown is that the ID now te uh, performance was about 74% compared to the Roche Cobos, whereas the 
And th so that's the uh, non-RT-PCR -RT method. The RT-PCR method, uh, the Expert Express, uh, pr pretty much mirrored the uh, Roche test. So the, R the rapid RT uh, PCR test performed the best. Um, if you look into the data for the um, ID now, whenever there's high or medium viral uh, levels of virus, the test performs very well. It's only in the situations where the viral levels are much thought to be much lower where the test falters and is a, has a 34% positive agreement. But if you have medium or high, the test had 100% performance. And with the Q, there's only one paper out there on this one. This was done at the Mayo Clinic. They compared the Q to the Hologic Aptima, which is probably the second or third most sensitive test on the market. And um, in this one, they um, did parallel testing in people who presented for testing. And what they found was that the Q uh, had a 91.75% 90, positive agreement and a 98% negative agreement. So it performed uh, relatively well uh, compared to RT-PCR. So those are the true rapid molecular methods out there. Um, I wanted to take a step back and just briefly mention about CT value. Have you all heard about CT values or called and asked for CT values? No? Okay. So I, I wanted to talk about this because uh, there was a point in time where we just got inundated with calls for CT values. Uh, we patients started calling uh, for their CT values. So the CT value is a number that you get from uh, RT-PCR and it's defined as the number of cycles of amplification that's required for the, uh, the uh, pro PCR product to go above baseline and uh, test can be identified as being positive. And this is an example curve from um, our standard PCR test in the central lab. And um, so how this works is that there's, uh, the test we use has 40 cycles, uh, heat and cool cycles. And um, what you see, all those lines that just kind of curve and flatten out, that's background, that's, that's uh, baseline junk. And the things that rise above that junk are the true amplification curves. And the assay gives you a threshold and if you took a line, a marker and drew a line from where the curve crosses that threshold to the bottom, that's where you get the CT values. So if you have a huge amount of viral uh, material present, uh, it's going to turn positive um, or sooner in the amplification cycle. So the first cur yellow curve there, that CT value is about 16. So there was presumably a lot of amplicon available and it amplified the quickest. Uh, whereas if there's very little uh, virus present, it requires many, many, many cycles before it turns positive. And the, the last curve to the right is one of those that has a, a, a fewer viruses present, presumably. And um, there are, when you do hear about it out there now, um, there are pitfalls to the P, uh, CT value because these are not transferable uh, and cannot be extrapolated to each, uh, to every molecular test. Each test has different characteristics, so you can't say a 35 means the same thing on, on two different tests. Um, and there are multiple factors that are at play here. One of the patient factors is the patient immunocompromised. If so, they tend to have very high levels of virus and they will have very low CT values. Um, when was it in the course of their illness? Was it early in the course of the illness where viral shedding tends to increase or is it late in the course where it just may be residual RNA? There are specimen factors and I'll get into this uh, in a minute. And then, uh, there are the, as I mentioned, there are test factors. So the graph on the right I took from uh, the website below, uh, and this is a plot that an investigator at the Arizona State University put together, and it summarizes uh, what's known about CT values to actual viral uh, concentrations. So the um, x-axis is uh, viral load, and the y-axis is a CT value. And um, you can see that um, th each instrument has a very different characteristic. And a CT value of 25 on one, so let's say it's the, the blue curve, the lowest blue curve, uh, means something very different uh, for uh, many of the other assays. So if you get a 25 with the test uh, illustrated by the blue curve, um, you would think, well, this patient's not infectious. Uh, this patient is very um, it, unlikely to transmit but if you run it on other tests, um, you'll get a very different story. So there are very, uh, very huge pitfalls with how um, p uh, people use uh, CT values, but 
we get called on this uh, all the time. And uh, in, in our system, we generally don't give it out unless it's uh, through an infectious diseases doctor or um, a team associated with the infectious disease team or through the medical director of each respective lab. And uh, so what is important about the CT value is that it's um, the viral, it's lowest early on in the disease course. So this blue, is that blue? That is blue. Uh, the blue uh, bars show the kinetics of the, the viral um, CT value throughout the course of infection. So from days zero to six, the CT values tend to be lowest, i.e. highest level of virus. And um, as time goes on, the CT value tends to increase. And at 20 plus days, it's in the level um, that, that um, it's questionable whether or not we should be saying it's detected. Uh, maybe we should be saying something different. But the, viral, the CT values tend to increase. And you can't interpret this unless, if, if you were to do the uh, serial testing, if you did it on the same, using the same instrument, then you can interpret it. But if you do uh, get a test with one method early on, and then later on you get another, uh, repeat the test with a different method, it's in a, not interpretable. And um, this is a, a illustration of a I took from this paper here, where they uh, a group in France tried to show presumptive infectivity by uh, comparing the ability to isolate virus in culture with a CT value. And uh, this one has been used uh, to set a uh, arbitrary threshold of 35 and above as being non-infectious. Uh, but what they showed was that uh, with lower CT values, uh, which would be on the left-hand side of the graph, um, virtually all the uh, cultures yielded uh, virus. But as the CT value increased, the proportion of virus isolated in culture goes down. And after 35 uh, or 34, um, they were unable to culture virus um, at all. So with higher CT values greater than 35, the virus is thought to be not replication competent, so presumably not infectious. Um, this was only done on, with one test, and the, where the threshold is on other tests is unknown, unless we, uh, people repeated this experiment. And it's impossible to repeat because uh, culturing uh, coronavirus is, uh, or SARS-2 uh, is not something that any, uh, most labs are able to do. It has to be a highly specialized lab with appropriate uh, skill and biocontainment uh, levels. As I mentioned, the um, specimen types also are important. Um, I had to show this because it started to get confusing when people talked about nasal. Do you mean nasal anterior nares, mid-turbinate, what are we talking about? And so the nasopharyngeal swab is the gold standard. And uh, that's one where it's the brain biopsy. And uh, that's where you push the swab all the way down to the posterior pharynx. Uh, the mid-turbinate performs, and I'll show you this in a second, almost as well. And that's pushing it and stopping it halfway. And the anterior nares is the front chamber. Uh, and, uh, and this is a table from the IDSA guidelines uh, summarizing the performance characteristics of different specimen types uh, compared to NP swab as the gold standard. And uh, what they show here is saliva without coughing has a 90% sensitivity. Saliva with coughing goes up to 99%, but we don't like it when people cough if you're around other people. Uh, the oral pharyngeal swab, uh, is, which is what was used early on in the pandemic, paired with NP swab, performed the worst at 76% uh, sensitive. The anterior swab is 89% sensitive, and the mid turbinate swab, so the halfway point, is about 95% uh, sensitive. Um, and when you combine the throat swab and the anterior swab, the performance goes up to about 95%. So the NP swab still remains the gold standard. Uh, specimen type. But as I mentioned, uh, we had significant issues with our um, swab supplies. Um, so for self-preservation, we had to figure out a way uh, to uh, do things differently and shift uh, things to uh, more stable collection methods. The problem with the NP swab is that it's considered an aerosol generating procedure. Um, and I don't, once you get halfway with trying to put a swab in my nose, I'm going to cough all over you. <laughs> and sneeze, and uh, so it's considered an aerosol generating procedure. 
And so you have to put on all the gear and the garb um, in order to collect an NP swab. And that posed so many logistical challenges that we shifted that out to the collection sites, which we've since disbanded. So for self-preservation, we had to figure out a way. And we, we did uh, our validation uh, with saliva. We did two validations. Um, and the first validation, we uh, compared saliva neat. So this one is people drool in a tube without any preservatives. Um, and uh, we also did patient self-collect uh, uh, um, mid-turbinate swabs. And so how this worked was that when a patient, pr patient pre presented to a collection site uh, for testing, uh, the lines were always long. So whenever they showed up in line, uh, if they gave consent, we would t uh, give them a saliva collection kit. By the time they got to the, to the front of the line, they've collected their saliva. We would take that, we'd give them a mid-turbinate swab and watch them the, do the self-swab, and then we would collect that. And then the, the caregiver would collect the NP swab. Um, the second validation we did uh, a month later uh, was uh, saliva only using the uh, SD, Spectrum SDNA 1000 um, collection kit, and that's illustrated to the right. So it's a empty tube with that little reagent container uh, sitting to the left of it. And after uh, the patient drools up to that black line, they apply that cap, and uh, uh, once they screw that on, the blister pack ruptures, and that reagent uh, flows into the chamber, and it has RNA stabilizer in it, and it inactivates the virus. Um, so uh, with our first validation, this is a summary of the results, and one of the, reason, uh, the data points that convinced us that we're okay by moving over to saliva, um, we found that it had a 93% uh, agreement compared to the NP swab and a 99.8% negative agreement. Um, the self-collected mid-turbinate swab didn't perform as well, so it performed about 88% uh, positive agreement, and uh, negative was up, um, at 100%. And uh, we did not move forward with that. The, at the time, the FDA established a threshold that you had to meet, which was 95% positive agreement. Uh, and they since relaxed that, and we, uh, that allowed us to move forward with uh, saliva neat. Um, the, this is a summary of the spectrum validation. Um, I put the uh, saliva neat on the left here just to, as a, a, a reference to compare. And with the Spectrum uh, 1000 kit, it had a 97% agreement compared to the NP swab with a 98.9% .9 negative agreement. So it, it performed a little bit better uh, compared to saliva neat. Uh, there are a lot of problems with it. It was a very expensive collection tube, and it also uh, was very painful for our techs uh, to screw that cap off. Just uh, uh, it elicited a lot of blisters and a lot of complaints, and people are using twee uh, pliers and, and whatever they can so they didn't have to put it on their hands. And also, it was not activated very well. So we often get tubes where the the blister the cap wasn't screwed on uh, appropriately. So only a tiny bit of the blue uh, stabilizing buffer flowed, flowed into the chamber. Uh, so we used that for a few months, and then we moved over to the, to the saliva neat um, uh, once uh, our, our text could take it no longer. Uh, and our credit cards got maxed. So, um, so at uh, Intermountain, the specimen types are listed here. Uh, the NP swab still is our standard. And if a patient shows up at the emergency departments or they're hospitalized, um, we will be doing NP swabs. Um, and uh, before October 2020, when um, there wasn't, we, we had an abundant supply of swabs, uh, we were using that at the collection sites as well. And um, at the time we were okay, adequately staffed, but um, we shifted over to saliva afterwards uh, because uh, we started coming into issues with staffing and uh, PPE, personal uh, protective equipment, and with swabs. Um, bilateral lateral na nasal swabs, that's new. Uh, uh, the first year of the pandemic, we didn't want to miss. Uh, we still don't want to miss, but for practical reasons, um, uh, we had to switch over to the bilateral nasal swabs. That's not considered an aerosol generating procedure. You could do that in your clinics, uh, and uh, so it's a, it's a much, uh, friendlier swab to collect on a patient. Um, and so we're using that in the Instacares for our molecular test. We're also using those in the um, primary care clinics. Uh, and um, 
the self-collect sites, if a patient is unable to provide a saliva specimen, it takes about three minutes to yield enough saliva. Uh, uh, if it's staffed at the time, uh, sta uh, someone will come, a caregiver will come and collect bilateral nares, uh, uh swabs. Okay. Oh, uh, one important thing I wanted to mention was that is that saliva is validated only for COVID, and um, there's not much data out there on how it performs for other respiratory viruses. So um, we're not using saliva for any other viral tests. So we're, we're not going to report uh, results with um, influenza or RSV. Okay. So I'm going to switch over to antigen tests and, and finish off with antigen tests. Um, this one is everywhere, uh, and uh, lots and lots of folks are using it. A lot of tests done by the public health lab in Nomi Health are antigen-based tests. And these are rapid, very portable, uh, easy to deploy, easy to perform, uh, much less expensive, but they don't perform as well. Uh, and uh, there's some issues with false positives. And uh, the latest evolution in the antigen tests are the home self-tests. And I've listed a few of the antigen home uh, tests there. Um, there's also some home uh, uh, molecular tests as well. I mentioned Q earlier. They have an over-the-counter EUA approval from the FDA. Uh, so um, you could take this and use that anywhere. Lucera is also um, a home uh, a test, molecular test. And it, it uh, has the same technology as the Q and the ID now. So these are the isothermal tests. Um, I'll go back for you. Sure. You're welcome. I don't know how the Lucera performs. I'm assuming it performs similar to the, to the Q. So um, uh, we have a lot of experience with the uh, antigen tests. And this slide summarizes um, uh, the performance characteristics that the companies submitted to the FDA for their approval. And I listed the three uh, most commonly used ones, the Sophia from Quidel the Veritor from BD, and the uh, Binax now from Abbott. And you can see that their data, when they, what they submitted was a 90, uh, two of them submitted 90 plus percent uh, uh, agreement with molecular test, and the Veritor uh, was at 84 percent. And we got interested, again, uh, for self-preservation, uh, because we didn't have enough uh, rapid tests. And at the height of this, we were challenged because the therapeutics were getting better. Uh, but we had to rapidly identify these patients because they would time out if we had to wait for a, a, a test result to come back. So what we did was we looked, we went live with the, uh, the Sophia, and uh, it's, this is a summary of what we, uh, of our experiences with the, the antigen test. So in roughly October, uh, late October, early November, we implemented the Sophia antigen test in all of the. Uh, well, we started off with three emergency rooms and then we expanded to all of them. Uh, and we stuck with the EUA, so we uh, tested, we only used this test for patients within the first week of illness. Um, if the doc enters a date that is outside of that, they wouldn't have the ability to order the test. And uh, so the first, for the first three weeks, we went with the nasal swab, because that was in their EUA approval. Um, and uh, you could, um, I'm summarizing the performance here. and. Uh, Whenever we ran an antigen test on a symptomatic patient, we would immediately collect a specimen for PCR um, if the antigen test was negative. And what we found with the nasal swab was that uh, we had a 35% false negative rate. Um, and so very different from what uh, was submitted to the FDA. And the estimated sensitivity was right around 66%. So um, we switched over at one hospital first to the NP swab thinking, well, maybe this will perform better. I mean, if it performs better with molecular, why wouldn't it perform better with antigen? Uh, so we did that, and that, uh, we found it, it, it did indeed improve test performance, uh, and uh, uh, we had a 25% 20, false negative rate when using NP swab uh, for an antigen test. And so we went live with that at all of our hospitals using NP swabs with reflex to PCR for negatives. Um, and we've since uh, uh, reduced use of the antigen tests and only use them for specific indications, um, but we always back up important uh, results with PCR. And this is a Cochrane review of all the different studies out there on antigen tests. Um, and uh, you can see they, they summarize the data for symptomatic, 
uh, up to seven days from symptom onset, overall symptomatic and asymptomatic. And um, what uh, they are reporting and what they show is that uh, the symptomatic uh, percent positivity ranges anywhere from 72 to 78 percent. Uh, and then in the asymptomatic, uh, the, the positive percent agreement is 58 percent. So if you're using an antigen test on a completely asymptomatic patient, it's not really much better than flipping a coin. Um, so, and we didn't really use them uh, in, in asymptomatic patients, so I don't have much experience about antigen tests uh, in, in that population. Um, there's not a lot of data out there on how the home tests uh, perform. Most of the home tests will give you two tests. Um, so, in, and the instructions are if you're negative with the first one, you have to repeat it two to four, uh, two to three days, one to two days later. And that uh, takes advantage of, uh, and presumably helps with the lower sensitivity if you do it multiple times. But this paper here has a lot going on in it. Um, they were looking at the performance of antigen tests, uh, and they looked at three different ones. And they, uh, what was interesting to me is that they also looked at how a patient self-collect test performs. And um, the figure on the right um, shows you the test performance. Uh, so one of the caveats about all these tests and the methods vary, and you really have to know the methods. What they did here was they took residual positives and tested them. And um, what they found was that uh, when the CT value was low, and there's presumably a lot of virus present, all three antigen tests perform pretty, pretty decently. Um, and when the uh, CT value starts to go up, uh, and so that was in the 25 to 30 range, uh, the test performance drops. And uh, above a certain CT value level, when the viral levels are lowest, the performance drops, uh, it was the worst. The other thing they show in this, so they show that similar findings, the sensitivity was 74%. Um, when they looked at patient self-collect or parents self-collect, the sensitivity drops to 57%. So again, this is no better than, uh, really, a, barely better than a flip of a coin on a good day. Um, so this is a busy slide. Uh, this is what the CDC recommends for antigen testing. Uh, and they break it down to symptomatic, asymptomatic exposed, and asymptomatic unexposed. Uh, and if you're uh, using it in the symptomatic patient uh, and the test is positive, you can presume, you comfortably say that uh, it's a true positive, um, and uh, especially if the patient has compatible symptoms. If you have a negative antigen test, uh, CDC is recommending to confirm that with a, piece, uh, a molecular method. Uh, in the asymptomatic, um, they, it's a different recommendation. Uh, if the antigen test is positive, because of issues with false positives, they're recommending to uh, confirm the positives by uh, a molecular test. Um, and if it's negative, uh, then uh, the presumption is there's uh, no current evidence of infection. And that's pretty much how we use antigen tests. And uh, this is the only slide I have on serology tests. Uh, it's not useful in the initial diagnosis of COVID-19. There's a whole lot of them out there. Uh, I'd encourage you to look at the FDA website because they summarize the performance characteristics of all the common uh, uh, antibody tests. And uh, the antibody tests are developed generally against the spike or the nucleocapsid. Um, and um, the spike versions of the serology tests are ones that can give you uh, um, an idea of whether or not a patient ref uh, responded to a uh, COVID vaccine. Uh, the nucleocapsid can't because the vaccines were developed against the spike. Um, uh, but th it's important to point out that uh, the FDA is not allowing anyone to make any claim about immunity. Uh, even if you have very, very high antibody levels, uh, we can't say that a, uh, a patient is uh, immune because none of these are all EUA authorized, so they do the bare minimum to get it approved. And there's not a lot of manufacturers that uh, did spe special studies to show that these antibodies indeed neutralize the virus. So there's no no way that you can make any claim that oh, you, your antibody level is of 5,000 means you're highly immune to the virus. Uh, we can't make that statement. So that, that's a, the caution with the serology test. 
So I'm just going to wrap it up and um, say we're not out of the woods, uh, but we have lots and lots of tools available. Uh, a lot of the tools are very confusing, and um, all the, most of the tools are uh, relatively unknown. Um, I failed to mention this earlier, but all but one of the tests that we're using for diagnosis are, are under EUA approval. So uh, there's bare mean, minimum criteria, and they don't go through the rigorous studies that uh, most tests do in the form of a clinical trial. Uh, there's only one test that's approved, and that's the uh, BioFire big, gigantic panel that tests 27 different things. Um, so you have to take, and all the antibody tests are uh, EUA authorized. Uh, so you have to uh, be careful about a lot of the different tools out there. Um, but, you know, we still need to uh, do what is known from the beginning. Uh, we have to take those safe behaviors. We have to keep testing. Um, and we have to know the pitfalls of the different tests. Um, and then the, uh, you heard yesterday about the therapeutics and, and the vaccines. Okay, so this is my last slide. The predictions are everywhere. Uh, so there was uh, a point in time that uh, many people, uh, many are still very concerned about this, but uh, we're still a few mutations away uh, from the, uh, the, the threat of a vaccine-proof variant. And then we would be starting from zero again. Um, and then uh, more recently, the former FDA chief, uh, Scott Gottlieb, uh, made this prediction that the Delta variant um, it, it was probably gonna be the last major COVID surge in, in the U.S. And uh, he predicted that it'd be over uh, by Thanksgiving. So it's kind of all over the place. I think we're still at a category four hurricane, if you wanna use that scale. Uh, category five, if you wanna use the hospitalization as your metric. So we're nowhere near being out of the storm. And I, I think it's premature to be sunbathing right now uh, or building houses or anything like that. Uh, so because of these wide uh, variation in opinions, I don't know what to think. So I went to my trusty eight ball. And so I asked, are we away from a mutation uh, that threatens everyone? Yeah. What did it say? And that says not sure. Not sure. Uh, um, and then for Gottlieb's uh, prediction, uh, it said, I got to beware. <laughs> so I don't know. I have an eight ball for sale if anybody is interested because this hasn't been very helpful. <laughs> anyway, so that is my last slide. And I'm happy to take any questions. Question? Yes. Uh, had COVID in beginning of April last year and uh, had a positive PCR for eight weeks. The brain biopsies weren't much fun. Uh, how many cycles were you doing back then? Um, so was in, in Intermountain, the, we have two, there are two oh, pieces. It was Intermountain. Yeah. So our, if it were the standard test, it took two to uh, three to five days at the time. Um, that cycles up to thir uh, 40. They were uh, doing 40 then. Mm -hmm. And anything above 40 is negative. If it were the rapid, the Cepheid, it cycles up to 45. And, um, and this, this is the problem with these tests. Like in some of our lab developed tests, um, we'll have an equivocal range. So you know, if, it, if I were designing a test, I would put the 35 and up uh, in an equivocal range instead of saying detected. Uh, because a lot of times what we're finding is when they see a detected, people are running. And about three, four days later, they pause and they wait a minute and they call, hey, what's the CT value? Oh, it was 42. Uh, I was like, oh. So that so, far out, if you were only going to 35 and it was positive, you would still think that was live virus? Um, again, so the presumption would be uh, if it stopped at 35? I don't know what they did. Yeah, if it stopped at 35, that still could be live virus. Presumptively, it would not be live virus. Um, so um, in one of the slides where I showed the, five, the multiple different tests, one of the consistent things was that most of those tests above a 35 fell in the not likely infectious range. But it, uh, again, it would depend on the timing too. So in your case, in the tail end, in the waning parts of it, um, that probably represents residual DNA, uh, RNA. If this were on day two of symptom and you had a 35, if you checked it again tomorrow, it probably would be a 25. Uh, yeah. Yeah. You're welcome. Yes. So this winter time, um, there's going to be a combination of flu, RSV, and COVID. Um, but the flu and the RSV can't be done with saliva. So does that mean that if you go back to, to we'll, yeah, great question. So um, 
most, uh, if you're at the collect, uh, uh, Instacares, uh, it'll be bilateral nasal swabs. Um, and that's purely because they have to garb up, put you in a negative pressure room uh, in order to get, get the NP swab. Then they have to let the air in the room cycle for about 10 minutes before they can open it up for you. So it is not practical to do a nasopharyngeal swab in the, in the outpatient setting. It, Yeah, so um, the self-collect sites will be COVID only, uh, and the, uh, the, the multiplex ones will be at the Instacares and with doctor's orders. So it, it, it won't be um, a saliva-based testing. And the only option for the, uh, um, for if you're worried about flu, will be the nasal swab, or an nasopharyngeal swab. Yes. Yeah, it's something you said, uh connected some dots for me. I just want to make sure I understood you correctly. You, meant, you said that uh, measuring antibodies post-vaccination doesn't do anything because nobody's proven that those antibodies actually are protective, and you can't say they're immune, mm -hmm. right? That's this correct. is why uh, immunocompromised patients post-vaccination, there's no way to measure or to know if they responded. Uh, but is it, isn't it enough, though, to measure antibodies, and if they have antibodies, presume that they're, mm -hmm. they've got some immunity? Yeah. So, but, but, um, but it's not routinely done, is yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. Uh, you, um, you, I'd say use caution with that. Um, uh, pure, um, and, you know, I, I think it would probably be okay to say, you, you mounted a response, your antibody level is this. Um, and uh, so that, um, I, th I think it, you would probably be okay in saying that you probably, I, I'd, ca I'd litter it with caveats. Uh, right. And I tell my uh, patients that, uh, yeah, you, you have, you've mounted a response. The FDA, uh, none of these antibody tests have been studied to show that these antibodies are, are actually laden with bullets and neutralize the virus. They could just be blanks. Uh, but um, it's a good response. Uh, so how's that for a non-answer? <laughs> Until they do these specialized tests, we don't know if these are neutralizing antibodies. Also, insurance may not pay for that. I've, I've encountered resistance uh, among providers to order the test, or the labs won't do it, uh, presumably because the insurance may not cover it. I, I'm not sure of that. Um, Have you had no. that problem? Uh, so... Um, we can in, in the Intermountain, uh, we, we do, early on when the antibodies tests were developed, uh, there are a lot of uncertainties about it. So we built an ordering process in there that if you click uh, um, cert uh, certain uh, indications, so this was uh, within, this was about 14 days into a, a infection and the patient has symptoms, the COVID test was negative, we'd allow it. Uh, just as a way of, uh, another way of trying to understand if, if a patient truly did have COVID, even if the PCRs were negative. Uh, so it may have stopped you uh, if it were in an intermountain. If a doc tried to order, if they don't click the right combination, uh, there's a chance that it would prevent you from ordering uh, antibody test. Okay. Hi. Uh, this may be an unrelated uh, topic, but have they done any lab tests on people who have long COVID symptoms? Uh, so I, I don't have enough ex experience, uh, uh, understanding the literature for long COVID to know about the, the testing okay. in that scenario. Sorry. Yeah. Um, thanks. This was so helpful. I just went to Canada and came back. And to get there, I did a PCR test that was free for me here. And then to get back, I had to buy from the hotel a, an antigen kit. I, uh -huh. I guess it was a kit. It was from... Um, Abbott. Abbott, that, okay. So the the Binax now. Mm -hmm. And it was interesting because it was $150, and I thought it was just a ripoff and the company's making money. But one of the things that I had to do was show, I had to download their app and then go to their website, and then they had a trainer or a guide, depending on, yeah. watch me do it and then show everything. Um, so I wondered if that improved the, um, I think you showed a slide that showed that the specimen collection is one of the pitfalls with those. So mm -hmm. maybe if they watch me do it, then it's yes. um, more accurate. So that's something. And then I also, if you already answered this, I was a bit late, but how are we detecting new variants with this testing? And if there's another variant, will we know? And how, what percent are we testing for genetic variation? Sure. Thanks. Okay. So um, 
the none of the uh, EUA approved tests, um, there are some that detects the Delta variant now, uh, and the, most of the ones in use right now don't tell you uh, whether or not you have a Delta variant. Uh, we are submitting all of our positives, and so is ARUP, uh, to the public health lab for sequencing. Um, but it, w one of our tests, the, um, the Thermo Fisher, it's the routine test, it detects three genes. Um, and we used that to infer whether or not we were dealing with the alpha variant. And I didn't include it in the talk, but um, the, the characteristic is that it's positive for the two, two genes, but the spike gene is negative. And uh, we watched that thing rise, and then it peaked at 75%, and then we watched it fall. As, uh, and so and, and the, S, the S gene would get restored uh, once the alpha variant left. That's the only way that we were able to tell that we were dealing with the alpha variant. Uh, otherwise, we're sending most of it, uh, anything we can to the public health lab for sequencing. About your comment, I, I think, I'm glad you uh, brought, brought that up about the Binax now. There's two versions of the home test. One is authorized for, it can be used for travel. So there's the test kit, you bring it home, you do it yourself, and you don't have to tell anybody your results. But the one that you use for travel, you have to do everything you described. And um, so you, you log on, they watch you do the test, uh, and then uh, 10 minutes later, you have to log back on, you have to show them the card, and then they'll type up a letter and send it to you, and that's how you get home. They have the video where you can watch them. Yeah, oh, I see, okay, so your elevator video, not music, okay. <laughs> R related question, I, I work with a lot of companies and business travelers, and I had a gentleman come to me that had had COVID four months prior, and he said, I really want to make this business trip overseas, um, should I go? And I said, well, I, I don't know. Get your PCR test and see. Well, it was negative, so he flew, and when he landed, the receiving country required one of theirs, and that was positive. Ah. Oh. And so <laughs> I got the company hooked up with, with the state health department, and I don't know, they probably in, ended up talking to the state department too or whatever. But in the end, he was uh, house arrest in a hotel room for 14 days and then put on an airplane and sent back. But they were trying to get him out to come home earlier or arrangements for him to stay after the 14 days. They wouldn't even let him stay. They just said, no, you have wow. to go. That's challenging. Well, what country? Just South Korea. South Korea, okay. But the follow-up question is, can I advise people any better other than to say, well, roll the dice if you dare. How, how brave are you? <laughs> I mean, I, I don't know what to say to them anymore. Yeah. Uh, I guess how lucky do you feel is the, the best way to, to advise them. Because you know, um, there are problems with false positives uh, with any of these tests. And the molecular tests do have a, a percentage of false positive. Early on when we were looking at our study, uh, at our test, um, we monitor everything. We scrutinize everything uh, that we do in the lab. And we look at patterns. Um, and uh, so if the pattern looks unfavorable and looks like there may have been a contamination event, we don't report it. And we have uh, a PhD level scientist review. He's reviewed all million uh, curves uh, that we've run. Um, and he'd look at the batch. And so there's a, depending on how they run the test, there's a possibility uh, that uh, these things could be false positives. How do you determine that and how do you lower the risk? I don't know. Uh, um, I would say, um, yeah, I, generally the, the odds are in your favor that four months afterwards, if you're an immunocompetent uh, person uh, and you're back to normal, the likelihood of you uh, being positive is much, much lower. And maybe you could do two tests before, uh, uh, just to maybe uh, to risk assess a little bit better. Um, that's a tough one, because you don't know how the tests in the other countries are run. Yeah. But I'd, I'd assume that South Korea has a, a really good, uh, really good effective test. You said that we can't really rely on the uh, antibody testing to determine immunity, that it's not really reliable. But aren't we using antibody testing to conclude that there's waning immunity over time after the vaccine and after natural infection, and that's how it was yeah. came out, you know, to, to vaccinate it again at six months with a booster, that was based on antibody, mm -hmm. right? So it seems like a little bit of a paradox that we're relying on it for that, yeah. but not for, you want to just sure. comment on it? Sure. Great observation, and thank you for asking that. So there are um, these studies. Um, so there are the EUA-approved antibody tests, 
And then there are uh, the neutralizing antibody tests, uh, the plaque reduction neutralizing test. Um, and most people who study these antibody responses to make claims that um, these are true neutralizing, these guns are filled with, bu with bullets and these antibodies actually neutralize the virus, use the PRNT uh, assay and not these EUA approved assays. And if this were a CDC done study, they have their own thing going on. Uh, and you'd have to check to see if they validated their antibody assay with the PRNT or if they use the PRNT assay. My, uh, my assumption, uh, and I'll have to go check on this because I didn't actually look at those details, but my assumption is that they used the actual neutralizing antibody assay to make conclusions that the antibody wanes. Yeah. That's great observation, though. <laughs>